In a previous video, I showed you guys how to make a leather armor pattern completely from scratch. And now that we've got our pattern, we can actually start crafting it. For that, I have actually bought some really cool leather. It's a B quality leather, which means that it has all sorts of marks and blemishes on it. Normally, you would want pristine leather. But for this, considering my character is a survivalist and a fighter, I figured B quality would be really cool. And I can't wait to show you guys. So without further ado, let's get crafting. To start, we can trace the pieces onto the leather with an awl. And while doing this, also add one centimeter allowance on each seam that will end up under another piece, as I forgot to add this to the paper pattern. I cut the pieces, then put them back on the leather mirrored for the other half. After this, I also cut both pieces for the back and the front piece. Then all the edges that will stay visible are beveled, with the exception of the middle back seam and the front darts. I also beveled the edges of the wrong side. This isn't fully necessary, but it gets rid of some of the fluff and makes the burnishing later on even smoother. Because for the next step, we are going to groove the stitching lines. For this, I set my stitching groover to 4mm and groove the line on the places where the stitching is going to be. This is done only for the pieces that will lay on top. For the back and the front, I grooved all around the pieces. But that is a decoration decision, as you will see in the next part. I want to keep the decoration simple. The idea is that this armor is purely practical and there isn't much need or time to add decorations. But I also really want to try out this rolling wheel for the first time. So the stitch lines I grooved earlier are guidance lines to follow with the roller. I rolled this all around the front and the back, applying quite a bit of pressure and rolling slightly forwards and backwards, so the wheel passes the same bit more than once. And well, this is what the end result of the wheel looks like. It's a different way of working for me. Usually I only fully carve and stamp everything. And I must say, this does go quite a lot quicker. It is a bit of getting used to. You need to apply quite a bit of pressure and really, really make sure that you go over each part two or three times by moving the wheel forward and backwards. But all in all, I'm quite happy with it. I am really curious though how it will hold up after I dyed it, if it's still going to be as visible as it is now. But before I can actually start dyeing, there's one thing that's really useful to do first, and that's to actually cut the straps so I can dye them along with the rest. For this short armor, I'm going to make one strap over the shoulders. As you can see, these are quite small, so I don't really have much more space than one strap. And on the sides, I think I'm going to do two straps. I think that will look quite pretty. So that means one, two, three, four, five, six straps in total. For the length of the straps, I remember when I did a test fit on the shoulders, there was a gap here, but it wasn't too big. So I think if I have the strap overlap three centimeters on this side, I think a strap of eight or nine centimeters here should be more than plenty. Which means that after this, I'll have to measure the length of the side straps and then we can get to cutting them. It turned out the side gaps were about two centimeters. So including overlap, I made all straps nine centimeters long. For the width, I realized the problem. I hadn't ordered any buckles yet, so I didn't know the exact width. But after a quick webshop spree, the buckles were ordered. They are listed as having 16.5 millimeter inner width. So the straps can be one and a half centimeter wide. I do want the straps to be slightly decorative. So I made a template and used this to cut the straps. After the first two straps, I made a small change of plan as the straps did look slightly short for the sides. So I made another template that was two centimeters longer and used this to cut out the side straps. To my big surprise, a package with buckles came in. This means I could finally also make a template for the buckles and cut these as well. After cutting the leather, all the edges were beveled to make them look even nicer. Before I dye everything, I want to punch the holes that the buckle bit goes through. For that, I've made a mark on my template, but I don't know if this one and a half centimeter is too much or not enough to have this buckle part go through. So I made a small mock-up template and with this we can check if my measurements are actually correct, if this is enough or too much to have the buckle bit go through. The idea is that when you have this hole, it is slightly bigger than the width of the buckle part itself because if it would be super tight, you can't actually open up the buckle all the way. So you want it to be slightly bigger to make sure that the buckle can easily move up and down. Well, it seems that that is the case here. 
So it's definitely not too small. And I think it can actually be slightly smaller considering I've got a gap of about, would it be three millimeter here? Then again, the leather will also add extra thickness. So you know what? I think I'm just going to keep it this one and a half centimeter. I can now use this template to make markings on every part where the buckle attaches. I'm not yet going to punch all of the holes that for the strap parts that go through here. I'm only going to do that after I'm done dyeing. After marking the holes with an awl, we can grab a proper hole punch and punch all the holes on the straps. Then we make it complete by cutting between these holes so we get an elongated slit. Next step is to dye everything and for that we first have to decide which color of dye we want to use. I've got this brown, this brown and this red brown here. And well of course this is already the color that we were already using for the costume and I do like it a lot. However, I think with the tooling that we've rolled into the armor, this dark brown is going to be too dark to properly see the tooling. So I quite like that color. However, I do not have a lot of this left and I'm not sure if that's enough. But the characters that we're playing are scavengers and the idea is, well, they make everything with whatever they can find. So I'm now thinking, how about if I actually start with this color and if I run out, I can always continue with that color. You know what? Let's do that. Again, I use a piece of an old t-shirt to rub the dye in circles on the leather. I find this gives a nice coverage after rubbing it in a bit. And this is the moment the B quality leather starts to shine. The rougher, uneven surface with marks is exactly the look I was going for. It really fits the rough living scavenger. For some reason, I keep forgetting that this method does not fill in the carvings and indentations. And again, I really like it, so I'm just going to keep it this way. It also fits nicely with the quiver. After the torso pieces, I also dyed all the straps. I am lightly rubbing the sides of these, but otherwise I am keeping all the sides relatively neutral. It fits with the dyeless carvings. I do find one layer a tad bit light and too reddish, which is easily solved by adding another layer. This gives the dye a nicer bit of depth. After letting it dry overnight, it is time to punch the holes in the straps. To line them all up, I used an awl and the template to mark a small point and then place the hole punch over it in such a way that the point is in the center of the punch. Whack it with a hammer a few times and you got your holes. Then it is time to punch more holes, this time for the stitch lines. These are punched along all the stitch grooves we marked earlier. And this time also along the two darts in the front panel. I found the strap ends a bit small to also draw the stitch grooves. So I used an edge creaser to mark where the stitches should end up and found out my forks can still be used to mark the placement of the holes. That's quite lucky, as that saves me having to measure each stitch hole. I do not whack the forks here, as that would also leave marks on the sides of the straps and we do not want that. Instead, I will use my awl to punch each hole individually the moment I will stitch them on. After that, it is time to burnish. For this I applied some tokonole and vigorously rubbed it with a burnisher. We do this for all the edges that will be visible. So basically the same edges that we beveled earlier. And yes, that also means all of the strap edges. I also burnished the backs of the straps. This makes them smoother, less likely to catch on clothing and I just like the feeling of it when using them. Doing this completely took me no less than three full hours. Next is applying some Resolin. This makes it less likely to bleed the dye and gives it a nice sheen. The sheen isn't necessary for this armor, but in a way I also find it makes the leather look even tougher. The big bits I did with a sponge, after which I went over the tooling and indents with a brush. I also did the straps with the brush, as the sponge would have just made a mess out of it. I must say that was a very productive day today, considering that when I started this morning, my first step was to punch the holes in these straps. But we kind of have to, considering my event is in two weeks and I have some very busy weeks up ahead with not a lot of time of crafting. But we're actually at a stage where you can finally start to put all of this together. And I must say, I'm really curious how that's going to turn out because I'm already super happy with this. 
Still, most happy with the fact that I went with B quality leather because this is exactly what we needed. All these marks and scratches, it's just perfect for this kind of armor. But anyway, enough talking. Time to continue crafting. For the mammoth task of sewing, we start with the smaller bits, so the side panels. First, draw a groove with the stitch groover on the piece that will lay on top on a centimeter from the edge. This is so we can easily line up the other piece on the back side, without visible markings on the front. Then we punch the first two holes with a sharp awl, after which we can widen the hole with the blunt awl. Then the needle can be poked through, and after making sure both sides have the same length, we can start stitching with a saddle stitch. I like to do the first two stitches flat on the table, and after that it gets inserted into the stitching pony, or with curved seams, just in my hand with the aid of some clips. Of course, this also gets repeated for the other side. After finishing both sides, we can start stitching the darts on the front. Because I'm working with a contrasting thread, I do want to make sure it stands out. In this case, I think cross stitches are prettier than straight stitches. And to make it easier for ourselves, start at the inside and work towards the outside, so you can pull the darts tighter with each stitch. Having repeating elements always works nice, so the two back parts also get stitched together with the crossed stitches. The further I get with this stitching, the more I dig it. The type of stitching and the thread color really work well with the die and the undyed parts. So I started sewing in the side panels and now I realize I need to do something that I usually don't really do. It's really annoying to hold these side panels in shape and also use the awl to properly punch all the holes on this side, especially now that we're getting further in and my thumb and fingers can't actually reach it. So usually I just put the two pieces of leather on top of each other and start sewing, but this time I actually have to glue them. And for this we can grab contact cement, which I can apply on the edge. I have to make sure I'm not going in too far because I only got a centimeter or so. I can then spread this out a bit. The idea of contact cement is that you put it on both sides, let it dry, and once it is dry, and as the name implies of contact cement, once the two layers of glue come into contact with each other, it will stick immediately. And it's a really good stick. And then we can glue them together. For this, we also need to make sure that we immediately glue the right depth of the side panel to the front, because once this is together, we won't be able to move it anymore. Something like this. Now I need to hold it for a bit, and then we should be able to just let it go, and then we can sew all through it. After the glue has dried, we can continue stitching in the side panels. This really makes it come together and it actually starts looking like the final thing. When the body is done, we can attach the buckles. But before we do this, we can sew in the buckles themselves. As it is only three stitches, I stitch the same bit twice. We can repeat this for all six buckles. Then we can attach them to the body. The exact placement was a bit of a guesstimate, but for the part with the buckles, I made the end of the leather part of the buckle strap line up with the edge of the leather panel it was attached to. After that, it can be stitched all the way around. Before we can sew on the buckles on the side on the back, we have to determine the placement. And well, considering the front has two panels here, I think it's the nicest if either buckle ends up at the middle piece of that pattern, uh, which will end up looking somewhat like this. And I think that will be really pretty. So what I'll have to do is measure these distances and make sure that this buckle ends up in the middle and that this buckle ends up in the middle. So let's do the measuring and then we can sew these on. After the buckles, it is time for the straps. And again, we start with the shoulder ones because once these are attached, we know how high the side seams will be and we can match that up easier. As we said before, I'm going to use the shorter straps for the shoulders and the longer straps for the sides. So for the placement of the shoulder straps, I have thought of a distance of two centimeters here. And the idea with straps like this is that it is the middle hole that's on the buckle when it is on the intended width. So I can just grab this and place this roughly on where the middle hole would be. 
Now, of course, I have to duplicate the placing of this trap on the other side. So for that, I'm going to measure what's going to be a nice distance to use. What I see is that the distance from the middle bit, so where it's the widest, is a nice two and a half centimeters from the edge. I think I'm going to use this so I can line this up. Two and a half, there we go. And then I also have to make sure that it's somewhat in the middle. So that means that this is the placement that we're going to use. And now that we've punched our first hole, we can just repeat the steps that we did previously. So I just did a test fit by attaching the shoulders together and putting it on and then holding the sides closed with my hands. And then just as I was already thinking, I realized that I can't put these straps in the middle hole because then this gap will still be too big. So the straps actually need to be two holes smaller than that. So on the but one smallest hole. And that's the thing with these adjustable straps. I mean, it's adjustable, so this isn't that big of a problem. But anyway, about attaching, I think I'm going to attach them at this distance from the edge. And that means that the stitching line across will be about half a centimeter from the edge. And as for the height, well, I mean, there is some slack in the straps. So I think I can just put both of these in the middle of these pieces. Now let's see if I can mark this hole without punching through the table. It's probably difficult to see on camera, but there is a dent in here and a dent in here. I can at least see them very well. Now we replicate these marks for the other side and then stitch all four straps on just like we did for all of the other straps. And these four straps are the last of the in total 12 straps that needed to be attached to this armor. Which means that after this we are done. The armor is finished. I really like the way it fits. The patterning at the beginning was a bit of a hassle, but fully worth the result. I think that this armor will be one I can have a lot of use of. It is relatively neutral and very functional, as it doesn't restrict any movement. The simple design and decoration, combined with the ruggedness of the B-quality leather, gives an armor that fits nearly any character I play. Which doesn't mean I won't find an excuse to still make new armors for every individual character. And with that, thank you all for watching, and see you guys next time.